All right, welcome to the segment of the show where, as I mentioned, Mr. Randy Walsh has joined me. So, uh, Randy, first of all, welcome and uh, thank you for your time. I'm, I'm really excited to, to get a chance to talk to you after reading your book. Thanks, Paul. I really appreciate it and I'm happy to be here. Awesome, awesome. Well, as I've mentioned, uh, got a copy of your book. Thanks for sending it to me. Got an autographed copy, which was really, really cool. And uh, this subject is near and dear to my heart, as as you know. And uh, the book was awesome, and really appreciate you taking some time out to to talk more about it because there were quite a few things in the book, and I kind of considered myself somewhat up to speed on a lot of the problems with what we were told about the moon landings and how they happened and all of that. I, you know, when you start, as you well know, as you start digging in, I start finding inconsistencies, anomalies, and things like that. I thought I had a good handle on that. I realized that there are a ton of other things that need to be taken into consideration, which your book covers. So that's what I wanted to talk about today and uh, appreciate your time. So number one, for, for the listeners out there, the viewers that are not familiar with you, give us a little bit of background, where you're from, and, and how did you even come to the point of writing a book about NASA and the Apollo moon landings? Actually, so in terms of my own personal history, I started 40 years ago, ironically, I started in the music business. So I was actually a musician for about a year or two, and that didn't work out. It's a, it's a tough road to travel, and I look back on it now, and I'm kind of glad, actually, it didn't work out. From there, I got into healthcare, worked in various positions in healthcare, and along the way, I've always had an interest in aviation. So along the way, I went to flight school, and got my private pilot's license, and I had that for several years. And so I just, you know, was just building up time. I, I was thinking of maybe starting a career in flying, and never really happened at that time. Sure. So, you know, anybody who's flying, it's expensive. So anyway, managed to get that done. So I had the pilot's license in my pocket, and I think this happened about. 20 years ago, I came home one night, turned on the uh, TV. It was a documentary about the Apollo missions. And document. I, I risen, wasn't really paying much attention to it until something caught my ear. And they were talking about the slingshot effect around the moon. And I immediately knew right away they were talking about Apollo 13. Mm -hmm. And something that I think it was Jim Lovell, who was the commander, I believe, of Apollo 13, something he said that I found very interesting and disturbing which was he was talking about how he was saying to his uh, colleague whatever you do when i fire the engines keep the earth within a grid pattern on the lunar module window and i found that a little peculiar in terms of navigating when you're 240,000 miles away from earth i mean even here navigating even a short distance precision is well it's a, it's imperative i mean you can easily find yourself off course and for them to be using a form of dead reckoning, which is what I liken it to, in a spaceship 240,000 miles from Earth, was a little peculiar to me. And I started to question the sophistication of uh, NASA's techniques, especially as it involved navigating. So that was my first sort of curious moment about the Apollo missions. And I have to say that up until that point, I was a supporter of the Apollo missions. I mean, I was inspired by it, and that's part of the reason why I got my pilot's license. So, you know, th that sort of stuff, I mean, I, I met at the time, I didn't really do much with it. And it wasn't until I went back to flight school and finally upgraded to a commercial pilot's license. And then from there, I said, I kind of like this. So I went and uh, added a flight instructor rating, then I added a multi-engine rating, and then an instrument rating. And then I sort of went back to looking at the Apollo mission, started reading the books. And, you know, in the age of uh, the Internet, there's a lot of video information out there, too. So I started watching some of that. And inevitably, you're going to fall into the conspiracy aspect, the Apollo missions. And at first, I have to be honest with you, I wasn't taking it too seriously until there was a few things that stood up for me. The first one I mentioned, of course, and then some other anomalies that I noticed. So I decided about five, six years ago, that I was going to, I dived into this with both feet. But I also found it was important not just to read the conspiracy books, but some of them are pretty good. They have some very good information in there. Uh, you're familiar with David Percy and Mary Bennett's book. I mean, it was just an awesome book. 
But I thought it was important to, to read the official literature on this from NASA and from secondary sources that support NASA's claim of going to the moon. And that's really where it started about six years ago. So that really led up to the book, which I started writing about a year ago and finished it uh, just what I published it last December. Yeah. Just so last December. Uh, yeah. So that's sort of the genesis of, of how it started. And, you know, having a general aviation background was very helpful in terms of some of the technical aspects of the Apollo missions. You know, everybody says, you, oh, you're not a rocket scientist and you don't have a PhD in this and that and whatnot and the other. And yeah, 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 right. Okay, but how many times do you question your doctor and your lawyer and your local teacher? I mean, come on, right? You, you don't need a degree. If you needed a degree to question everybody in every discipline, you wouldn't leave your house. You would just point. sit there. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of the genesis of how the book came about. Very good, yeah. And, and it's an interesting approach because I think a lot of the people that I've met you know, just recently when they when they question the moon landings, it starts with like maybe the photographs or, you know, like you said, you start watching some, maybe something some more of a mainstream documentary that says there was a problem with this, a problem with that. But with your experience and, and your background, it was interesting that it was kind of a technical thing, like you mentioned about na navigation that yeah. first kind of triggered that, like, you know, well, obviously I've never flown a spaceship to the moon and back, but understanding the basics of navigation got you to go, hmm, I want to know more. I'm intrigued at least. And there may be something I want to learn. Maybe maybe I just don't know. I mean, there's more to learn there, right? But that approach, questioning is what led you that, uh, down that path. So great. So here's the book. And as you can see, uh, Randy, I, I, I've made my notes. And I really, what I appreciated about the book was there were just so many things that I hadn't considered yet. And they brought a lot of new information to the table. So I'm encouraging everybody, obviously, that sees this, that's interested in this subject, definitely get a hold of the book. And the cool thing is, this is part one, from what I understand. It's a technical book. That's what I liked about this, is it kind of dove into a little bit more about the science and the, and the technical stuff. And that's what we're going to kind of go through today. So I've got a list of items that I really wanted to kind of expand upon. Sure. That I thought, that, that struck me when I was reading this, that I went, Wow, never thought about that. This is interesting. And the first thing really I wanted to dive into, if we can jump right in, is the F1 engines, okay? And, and what I took away, and maybe you can kind of expand on this, the F1 engines obviously were said to be the most powerful engines that humanity built, and it was required to lift this amount of weight into Earth orbit and then all the way to the moon. But what you found in your technical studies was that potentially, the output of these engines the um, wasn't what we were told it to be. Can you kind of expand on that? Because that really was where you start the book and really, I think, grab the reader and saying, well, we were told X, Y, and Z, but there's a lot of missing information when it comes to really the power of these engines that was required. Yeah, that is what really struck me when I started researching this. And I just want to say for the viewers that the, this could be the very crux of the whole Apollo mission hoax. I mean, without the F, it's important that they everybody understands that without the F1 engines and without them functioning properly, there would be no moon landing. You're talking about a Saturn V rocket that's over what 325 feet tall, and it's about 2,800 to 900 tons. Wow. And included in that is the Apollo hardware for landing on the moon, which is about 46 tons. So you need powerful engines, and we're specifically talking now about the first stage. There's three stages to Saturn V rocket. So when we're talking about the F1 engines, we're talking about the engines in the first stage, and there was five of them. So without the F1 engines, there's no Apollo moon landings. That it's that. So if they're proven fake, and I actually believe they are, I don't think it's potentially, I think it's an assurity that those engines were not functioning properly. That negates the whole process. That negates the whole missions. And before I start with the F1 engine, I just want to say that I did talk about the reason why I wrote about the other stuff, and I will write about the other aspects of the Apollo missions, is simply because the proponents will come back and say, oh yeah, but what about this on the moon, and what about that? So I wanted to talk about that and show that how impossible that would have been as well. But, but you know, because I find that the NASA proponents have a question and an answer for everything. So you need to counter those claims. So it's a very detailed lot of work, but Nonetheless, so with the F1 engines, each engine 
would produce, according to the records, 1.5 million pounds of thrust. Now, there's five of these engines on the Saturn V, and total of about 7.5 million pounds of thrust. They needed those engines to lift the hardware. What I found very interesting was the testing aspects of the F1 engines is very questionable, and I'm talking about the static testing. And for those who don't know, this actually started back in 1958. The Air Force was actually working on the F1 engines, and then by proclamation from President Eisenhower regarding NASA, he assigned that to NASA, so NASA took that over. And this is where Bill Casing comes into play here. Bill Casing was an employee for Rocketdyne, and he had his job was to analyze the reports in part from the F1 engine data. And he saw something very peculiar, that the reports were not adding up to the expectations of the F1 engine. So that's kind of where this all started. And it's important that people realize that Bill Casing was the first, I think, whistleblower when he published this book about 40 years ago. Now, he left eventually in 1963, disgruntled about what he saw. So, in my research, I came across many aspects, many things, but one of the papers I came across was one published that you'll find on the Alice.com website. And for your viewers, that's www.alice.com. And it's by a Russian scientist, and he did an in-depth 60-page report on the F1 engines and the power output. And he included that the report. I must add, is very mathematical. It's very technical. Um, it's it's a it's, it makes for some tough reading, but he does raise some very interesting points about the F1 engines. And he noticed with Apollo 6, specifically with Apollo 6, he noticed that there were some serious problems. Even NASA admits that there were serious problems with the launch of Apollo 6. So what he's focusing on, this Russian scientist. By the way, just let me get his name. The name is in Russian, so if I misspell, if I mispronounce, I'm sure I'll be forgiven. Gennady Avchenkov, I believe is his name. And what he really focused on most was the instability of the combustion chamber of the F1 engines. And even, of course, NASA admits to problems with the combustion chamber. So for the viewers out there, just to briefly describe, everybody knows you see the rocket nozzle on the bottom, the rocket. Sure. That. Right on top of the nozzle, you have the, an area called the throat. And then above that, you have the combustion chamber. The combustion chamber is where the gas is ignited in some, well, you can liken it to a controlled explosion. Yeah. It's that explosion that works its way through the throat and out the nozzle, which pushes the rocket up. And that's a very simplistic way of saying it. But what was going on with the combustion chamber with the F1 engines is the issue of cooling. The combustion yes. chamber, because of the explosive gas, the propellant that was pushed into it, could reach temperatures of up to almost, what, 3,300 degrees Celsius. That's about, what, 6,000 Fahrenheit. That's hot. <laughs> yeah. That's very, very hot. That's very, very hot. So they needed to cool that. You have to find a method to come to cool that um, chamber down. Because if you can't cool that down, it's going to distort. It's going to and fail. It's going to it's going to fail. And you're going to have an explosion. Okay, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So what they did was they came out with a cooling system called the generative cooling system for the F1 engine chamber. And what that is, is, is it's hundreds of small, thin, very thin tubes that run along the combustion chamber, the throat, and I think it's about halfway down the nozzle, if I'm not mistaken. And they would run propellant through that. And that propellant would absorb the thermal energy from the combustion chamber and uh, transfer that energy into the fuel and that fuel would be recirculated back into the combustion chamber. Therefore, supposedly, in theory, making it um, a more efficient engine. Mm -hmm. That's where the problem is and that's where the problems that Chekhov noticed with that is that is the cooling process that wasn't working. In order to counter that, NASA would have to, in a sense, for lack of a better way of putting it, would have to throttle back the power. Yeah. You couldn't run it at full power. Now, and this is important, if you can't run the engines at full power, again, whether you're using the F1 engines, even if you're using the F1 engines, you can't use them at full power, full thrust, you have no Apollo moon landing. Yeah. So he did a lot of analysis on that. And by analyzing photos and film of Apollo 6, 
he was able to also detect kerosene burning. And this is interesting because kerosene was only used in the F1 engine at the first stage. It wasn't used in the other two stages. So that was another given with that. So that's based, that's the basis of his work, and it was it's very compelling. I encourage everybody, if you can get around the math, to, to read it. You don't have to be a math expert to understand what he's saying. So I really do encourage people to read that. So that's basically the gist of that in terms of the engine combustion problems. Got it. No, well, that's a great explanation. I, I like the way you kind of break it down for the you know the layman to, to be able to kind of understand you know where those problems come in. I thought it was interesting in the book too. I think you pointed out that this cooling system was only then used, we are told, in, you know, during the what the Apollo program, like the 60s and 70s. It's not technology. You think that it would have been improved, and you know, we talk about this a lot when it comes to you know why haven't we been back to the moon? Technology typically should get better over time, but even more recently, NASA was is using, I think, what you term just the Soviet-style cooling system. A after that, it was it's, this cooling system. We were told worked perfectly in the 60s and 70s, but wasn't continued, wasn't expanded upon, wasn't improved, which is an, an interesting, I think, data point. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that really troubled me the most too. Is that you know, you pick any other industry in the world. Let's pick aviation. Aviation has gone through leaps and bounds in the last several decades, you know, especially since World War II. And I have never seen one case of aviation using brand new technology and then discarding it and saying, oh no, we'll try something else. I mean, if it works, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? <laughs> and it just amazes me that of all the industries in the world, the most important industry, according to a lot of people, which is NASA uh, in terms of the space agency, which is supposed to be our future. By the way, we're still waiting 50 years on for that. It amazes me that they actually went backwards in technology. And I found that troubling. And, and you're absolutely right, Paul. What's interesting about the regenerative cooling system, which was used on liquid fuel rockets, is that this technology with the F1 engines seemingly worked perfectly from 1968 to 1972. Remember, the first uh, Apollo 8 was actually launched in 1968. And for so almost five years after 1972, I did in 1973, they used the Saturn V rocket once for the Skylab program, right? Which I won't get into too much now. I mentioned that in the book. But it's interesting that it worked perfectly. Now, when I say it worked perfectly, and NASA has come up with a counterclaim to this, they say, well, it wasn't perfect. You know, there was anomalies and there was problems, but we worked through it. No, no, no. I like to use the old adage uh, as a pilot. The definition of uh, perfect landing is when you walk away from. That's and, right. Yeah, and these uh, engines work perfectly. In all practical purposes, they were perfect, right? Yeah. So NASA tries to cut it up, but it just doesn't hold water. So here you have the F-1 engines working perfectly between 1968 and 1972, up to 1973 rather. And then after that, no more. They actually buried the program, stopped using, of course, the F-1 engines, and transferred over to a Soviet-style cooling system. Yeah. Which is very telling. Very telling. Yeah. Why would you throw away proven technology? It makes no sense to me. Uh, it makes no sense to anybody who has actually common sense. Now NASA is kind of in a quandary because they're looking for a heavy lift capability. And I'm thinking, well, you got the it's, engines. That's right. It's probably it start, start, start where it, it worked before, like you said, if it ain't broke. If anything, they should have improved. We should be, logically, we should be lifting a lot more weight, at least into low Earth orbit, you know, or whatever now, because of the power that we were able to, we were told, that existed in the 60s and 70s. Exactly. And let's use another analogy again in aviation. I mean, not only should we be living heavier payloads in rockets, but, and Marcus Allen actually brought this point up, and he's absolutely right, is that we should be going, we should have gone by now beyond propellant, chemical propellant rockets. There's only so much they can do. You cannot, yeah. you would literally, I mean, the bigger you go, the more fuel you need, the more energy. Yeah. The bigger, exactly. the more fuel. I mean, it's just crazy. You cannot sustain that. So you have to find another form of propulsion. And the analogy I want to use is in aviation when we had propeller driven aircraft back in the 1920s and 1930s. It was, it was fantastic technology back then. I don't scoff at it today. I still fly. I love propeller-driven aircraft. It's still good technology. But aviation went further. They then came out with the jet engine. And then they improved on that and came out with more efficient engines. And then they improved on the other technology in terms of 
um, going from hydraulics to fly-by-wire systems and so on and so forth. But the aviation industry seemed to have just stopped 50 years ago. It just hasn't gone anywhere. And I might add that you would think that this would be prolific in the, in the sense that you know, you would have other countries around the world jumping on bandwagon, sending their rockets up there, but you've got only one country right now, right now as we speak, that's capable of, la of launching a crew to low Earth orbit, and that's Russia. Yeah. With, with, with a Soyuz rocket, and I might add, using 50-year-old technology. There Does that go. make sense? No, it doesn't. It really no. doesn't. Again, co common sense should kind of lead you down this path. In yeah. my in my opinion sounds like you you share that so i want to transition over to apollo i think it was the apollo 11 liftoff now as you talk about in the book and there was a gentleman that uh, i believe that worked for nasa at, that videotaped the liftoff and the analysis that the book kind of goes through talking talks about kind of a the case in point here about that these f1 engines don't seem to be operating at maximum capacity that they, that they would have needed to based on wh how quickly or how or, or how slowly the rocket got to different altitudes you know what i'm what i'm talking about here it was based on yes. the cloud the cloud deck layer and how how long it took to reach that you, you would do yeah. a better job explaining it but i thought that was really really intriguing to understand taking this video of the apollo 11 liftoff and saying okay based on the thrust that it should have had, it should have been a lot higher, a hundred and something seconds into liftoff. Can you can you kind of tell the, the, the listeners there what, what you were talking about in the book? Yeah, first of all, let me give some background on that, on that story. There was an individual working for NASA at that time, he was actually, I believe, on contract for IBM. He had extensive work with the Gemini program and the Apollo program, right up to Apollo Soyuz. He worked, I also think, specifically with Apollo 13 on reentry procedures and he worked on the Apollo Soyuz program, which was the last aspect of the Apollo program. And for your viewers that don't know, Apollo Soyuz is when they supposedly docked in low Earth orbit. So anyway, he being an obvious NASA proponent, um, showed up that morning with a Super 8 film for the launch of Apollo 11. And, you know, he had no reason, no, all, no other motive um, than, you know, he was inspired. Yeah, yeah. especially since he was working for the very same people he was filming, right? What's interesting about him is he's not the only one. There was many people that took Super 8 films back then. I know they're a little, not as sophisticated as we have today, but it does the job, right? Yeah. yeah. So he took a film right from before the launch to when the launch of Apollo 11 was out of camera range. And that makes his film very, very... Because it's continuous, right? Continuous yes. film for yeah. however long it, that was. There's no breaks in the film, so the timing could be really analyzed, right? Absolutely. And there's no breaks in the film. And, of course, this was actually analyzed by Andre Bolutov. And they did... There you go. Yeah. And they did uh, an analysis of his film. He submitted his film for analysis. He's, he, he has since, I think, wised up. This man, by the way, who took the film, his name is Phil Palacia, if I'm pronouncing his name right. And he was the IBM contractor. And years later, I think he began to doubt. They don't talk too much about why his motivation in submitting the film, but it's obvious he submitted the film to these researchers because he saw something in there that was peculiar to him, mm -hmm. right? And so he has nothing to lose or gain by submitting this film for analysis. And it was uh, subjected to analysis. And of course, these scientists would have to do that because their credibility is on the line. So they have to make sure that this film is authentic and which they did. So that's all verified. And you can go on the Alice.com website and you can pull up their paper and you can pull up their article and you can go through the verific verification process yourself. So right. what they did is they looked at his film and he matched it to the official film of Apollo 11. And it matched. And that's the interesting thing. It matched. What they noticed is, is that in his film, you have the Saturn V passing through high cirrus clouds and I think I mentioned it was about 105 seconds, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, that's what my notes said. Yeah, you mentioned yeah. about 105 seconds is when they reached that cloud layer. Yeah, or yeah. Or seemed to a, appear to have gone through it at that point or reached it, yeah. Yeah, and what is interesting about that is, is that 
at that point, at that time, um, they should have been much higher. They should have been at, I think, approximately 75,000 feet. Now, the reason why they know that is because as a pilot, we all know cirrus clouds go no higher than about 30,000 feet. So it's between usually 25 and 30,000 feet. These are high cirrus clouds. And for them to be at, for Apollo 11 to be at an altitude of 25,000 feet at 105 seconds meant that they were three times lower than it should have been. That's, that, that's what struck me as, wow. You know, yeah. there, there's something very interesting because they yeah. should have been, like you said, based on, and what NASA said was, what at that point they were close to 80,000 feet. Yeah. That's yeah, the claim. 75, 80,000. Yeah. And, and, and this is very interesting because, I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to actually read and figure this part out. If you, you need to be at a certain altitude and maintain a certain velocity to get to the orbit you want to get to. I mean, the whole idea of the rocket in the first place is to propel it. Yeah. And if you're not able to keep up that momentum and you're at a lower altitude, than you should be, you're not going to reach your optimum orbit. In fact, you're most likely not going to reach orbit at all. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what happened to Apollo 11. It didn't reach low Earth orbit. I mean, I highly doubt it did. I mean, they all doubt that, actually. In fact, they'll go so far as to say it ended up in the drink, you know, the ocean. But you yeah. see, people say to me, and they scoff at me, and they say, well, Randy, you could all, we all saw it on TV. I mean, how many times have you heard that? It's true that <laughs> you saw it on TV. What they don't seem to know is, is that there's a certain range of those cameras back then. And how do you know where that rocket is? After that, they go to animation. Then they tell you, you know, you have Walter Concrete on there talking about, look at this is rocket, it's a cartoon rocket, and this is what they're doing now. So how do you know? You don't know, right? Faith. Now, gotta, I'm not saying everything. I said you just gotta have faith at that point. Oh yeah, you gotta have faith. Who sang that? Was that George Michaels who sang? You gotta have faith or That's something? That's right. That's right. May he rest in peace. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So you cannot deny that piece of evidence. That's fact. That's fact. The film shows it. And I'd like to know how many other Super 8 films are out there. There has to be tens of thousands of them out there that NASA probably even knows of, but are, are trying to suppress this, this knowledge. But that's very damning evidence. I mean, if that's true to the skeptic, forget about landing on the moon. They never got to low Earth orbit. Yeah. Yeah, and this rocket, not... this massive piece of machinery was, had to be at that level, had to be at that altitude, at that point of the launch, and to be three times lower and going slower and and end up only being you know if that's true 25 to 30,000 feet that thing was that thing was just a really expensive airplane i mean just it wasn't was, going to be getting that high enough that far enough quick it enough. was a multi-billion dollar showpiece yeah yeah that's what it was it was to keep the viewers happy it was to raise the flag and salute it and i am not knocking nationalism i i'm irish and i love my country too and i'm not saying anything like that I have family and friends in America, you know, the United States love going down there. So it's just not a swipe at Americans by any means. The world, not just Americans, the world was fooled by this. We were all in this together. And when people come out and they criticize Americans, oh, you guys believe anything, so, so, so do we. So do we up here in Canada. And so do we over there in Europe. So let's not blame Americans. I say to people, but you know, it's a, it, it is a fact and you cannot escape that fact that it was not at its optimum altitude to reach low Earth orbit. And that, that's a fact. And out of range of the cameras, most likely that uh, ended up in the Atlantic Ocean. Got it. Good. Well, thanks for doing that. I've got, I've got a, a bunch of other things and but sure. that was really important. I think we, it was good to spend some time on that because there's a lot of, in my opinion, you know, you know a lot of hard evidence that we can kind of point to to say, you know, just to kind of wrap up, that these engines had to be running, uh, like you said, at, at peak capacity, and there's just so many problems to show the lack of testing, the, you know, uh, and then observational photographic or videographic evidence that potentially they weren't running at the level that we were told they were is 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 worthy of note. So let's jump over, uh, the next thing on my list, you kind of brought up Apollo 13. I didn't know this. so. I saw Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks. That's where I learned about how all this mission went down, uh, or you know, the the story that we were told. But Frau Mora was their destination, and this was what you kind of said in the book, and you can expand on this, maybe how you came to this conclusion. That wasn't a destination that they wanted to go because of the location on the moon, and so this story that there was a problem 
and they were, you know, had to abort the mission and uh, come home without landing on this on this spot was something they had to come with, come up with late in the game to kind of cover their tracks. Yeah, and that again is one just one more curious aspect of this whole mission. Now, I, I want to state before that there's there's a lot of mixed messages and mixed information about this aspect of Apollo 13. It involves the Terminator on the moon. And a Terminator on the moon, for those who I don't know, it is just basically between sunlight and dark. So the term, so they were, they were actually landing near the Terminator of the moon. Now, there's a th there was a theory that they had, NASA had screwed up in its calculations during the mission. Remember, I think some of these missions were actually filmed live for theatrics, right? And they miscalculated and that if they had to continue on their flight path, they would have landed on the dark side of the Terminator. Mm -hmm. Now, that's very important to digest for the simple reason that the only lighting that NASA had up there was the sun. And they were not equipped for a night landing. We're not talking IFR flying here, okay? <laughs> so they needed to land on the sunlit side of the moon. Now, I've read other reports, and there's actually a software program, if it, the name escapes me right now, but a software program that you can actually put in the date and time of the Apollo 13 landing. Even if they were to land near the Terminator, and you're dealing with a visual landing in an unfamiliar terrain, and the thing about landing near the Terminator is, is that even if it's on the sun its side, it's still very close to the Terminator, so you have longer shadows than you would have if you were landing well away from the Terminator on the sun that side. And precision is the most important word here when it comes to landing any aircraft, let alone a ship on a foreign planet. The theory is, and it's a very viable one, I actually subscribed to it myself, that NASA basically screwed up and they had to come up with a way to salvage that mission. So they came out with, well, NASA Apollo 13 had an accident. Yep. Solve the problem of them having to land on the moon. So that's right. the basic background on that. That's the basic. We'll let, let the folks uh, get the book and, and they can dive yeah. into that more. But I just thought that was a very interesting thing because I hadn't heard that yet. I was probably more subscribing to something that even though this was the third manned moon mission that was planned, that there had already been the excitement and the inspiration was already starting to by the by the people of the world was starting to kind of wane a little bit. And this yeah. was this was some and another theory that I think you could have was this was to stir up some more drama to create more interest in the program to continue to get funding for the space programs. I don't know. That's kind of where I was that, that, that this was something for that reason to, to generate yeah. more interest and to get people to watch TV again and to, and to, and uh, and to be involved emotionally with that story. You know, to say we got to bring those bring up bring our boys home sort of thing. Exactly. And I do want to add that I'm not the first one to bring this up. Uh, and there's there a couple of other authors, uh, David Percy, Mary Bennett for for uh, one and Andrew Johnson who's written some good books himself and has talked about this as well. But what is different here is that now we have the technology to make that determination once and for all. And it seems to be one aspect of the Apollo missions that NASA wants to distance itself from. It doesn't really have a ready answer for it. Yeah. So that's very telling. So I, as you say, it's in the book and they can, the reader can uh, read more about that. Very good, very good. Well, let's get into the next bullet I had here on my list. Uh, we're, we've been recording for over 30 minutes, and this one I think is really, really intriguing. And for the techies out there, I think they're going to like this. This is the Apollo Guidance Computer. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think it's, it's pretty well known that compared to today's technology, obviously this is a very low computing power. You know, people say, hey, I got more power in my cell phone than I do, you know, than, than what this thing had. But there was a lot of other things that you brought up in the book that I was hoping you could talk a little bit about. You talked about a non-autonomous, it being a non-autonomous computer. You talked about it having really no memory, so to speak. And, and those are things that would be key components of this computer, would need to be key components of this computer if it really was able to do what, it, what we were told it did. And having, lacking these things really, again, is, is some evidence that there's some shenanigans going on here, I guess. 
could you expand on the on, uh, just overall on the on the Apollo guidance computers? Because this is a piece of technology that had to be invented to be able to navigate this great distance in this unfamiliar terrain, like you say, and it had to be pretty special piece of equipment. And analysis is showing that it, it maybe it wasn't. Yeah, and like I said at the beginning, this was the this was the aspect of the Apollo missions that initially got me involved in this that really raised my curiosity as to how you can navigate back to Earth using visual references. I mean, that is just crazy. I mean, you know, you don't just point the spaceship at Earth. You've got to be, you know, we're talking about very precise, complicated yeah. equations here and calculations that need to be done. So, as you mentioned, a lot of talk and discussion and, and, and books have been written about the Apollo guidance computer in terms of its low memory power. Yeah. And the low memory power is given, I, had a, I think I believe it had about a 38,000 word capability, if that. And, and yes, it's less computing power than what you would find in your car uh, 15 years ago. Wow. Uh, years ago. So it's not a lot. But so that aspect of the Apollo computers has been talked about. So I yeah. didn't focus on that too much in the book. Yeah. What we focused on is, is what is it capable of doing? What was it capable of doing? And how was it capable of coming up with solutions? So let's talk about a couple of scenarios. First of all, to talk about exactly how they navigated from the Earth to the Moon. Now, the Apollo guidance computer was supposed to be the most sophisticated computer of its time. It was actually supposedly a fly-by-wire system. Yeah. The first integrated fly-by-wire computer with the other systems of, of a machine, in this case, the Apollo spacecraft. And, however, they were using celestial navigation as well as a form of navigation. Most people know what celestial navigation is. As you know, sailing ships around the world for hundreds of years have used that as a form of navigating. And it works well when you're in the ocean and you're familiar with land masses and you know you've done it a few times and even then you're off course you know so take that and put that in space and we're talking millions upon millions of square miles of space between the earth and the moon okay so what I found very interesting is this the Apollo guidance computer for the most part ran some programs on its own but it did require crew interface to run some of the more important programs like navigating. So what they would have to do is, is they would periodically along the way, I think it was two or three times according to the official record, they would have to stop and they would look at the stars and get a position fixed. Now think about that for a second, a position fixed. Now they wouldn't stop of course, but they would have to pause what they're doing and look out and get a position, and they would use uh, two stars to get a position fixed. So they would triangulate between two stars. Okay, this is getting funny and funnier wow. as, as we speak, yeah. Wow. That's not enough. They only had 37 stars that they could choose from to navigate from the Earth to the Moon. They were only able to see, according to the official record, 37 stars, the brightest stars, and they were used for navigating. Wow. Okay? So what they would have to do is realign the, the computer to the star settings in the sky yeah. and, and use that to navigate. But here's the interesting thing about the Apollo guidance computer. The Apollo guidance computer did not maintain track. It had used the stars to get a position fix. Yeah. The rest was guesswork. And on top of that, in terms of the Apollo guidance computer not being autonomous, it didn't have the ability to make course corrections on its own. On its own. Exactly. It relied 100% on the input. It re absolutely. So they would end up aspects to they would set up equations and our calculations and they would go through together now we're talking about a rocket that is traveling at several thousand miles per hour now keep in mind of course officially this would have been slowing down gradually because of the earth's gravitational pull right mm -hmm. so until it gets to the liquid gravisphere which is where it becomes neutral so it's constantly slowing down right you don't know if you're off course until you do a position fix so what if you do a position fix and you find out oh my goodness I'm several thousand miles off course well now you've got to correct with thrusters or with the uh, main engine and that requires propellant and propellant was very limited because of the weight restrictions on getting that rocket off the ground given the fact that they would have to constantly interface with the computer and take two yeah. star settings get a position fix and then make a course correction 
miraculously, according to NASA, they were never off course. So, never off course, so it didn't matter. They yeah. didn't have to use the propellant. It was perfect. Exactly. Exactly. So they say. And you bring it up in the book, just the, the myriad of potential issues that could have came up. And and yep. just the fact that, you know, there really wasn't any redundancies either. This, these things, these missions had to be right down the line. They had to be perfect. And yep. everything had to go as planned for the, for, for, for the whole thing to work. And miraculously, with the exception of Apollo 13, they did. Yeah, and, and that's the other thing. And Apollo 13 is another interesting aspect of navigation too. We'll get to that later. But what I find interesting too is, is that any number of things could have happened with the Apollo spacecraft. It could have been hit by debris. It could have been hit by celestial objects. And I mean celestial debris. Anything could have come in its path. How would they have known? There was no proximity warning system on this computer. It was not capable of detecting anything that may be of some kind of danger. Yeah. And even if they were to somehow find out that there was imminent danger ahead, how would they plan for it? Yeah. The computer would need to make decisions within uh, milliseconds. I mean, you have a millisecond be between life and death when you're in space. I mean, it's over. It, you don't have time to think about it. But here's what their backup plan was. They would radio Houston, Houston would do all the calculations, ground control, and then radio that back up. Now, a radio signal is only a couple of seconds there and back, but what about the extra seconds or minutes needed to find out what needed to be done in terms yeah. of calculations? And they had to send yeah. up. And they couldn't just send it up. They had to send it up by voice. So they had to send it, it had to be written down, and they would call up and say, okay, do this, 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 and this. In space, it's a very hostile environment. Let's not kid ourselves. Anything could have happened at a moment's notice, and you would need a computer, an autonomous computer, That's to right. make those decisions. To be able to make those decisions. I think, you know, many people still don't probably realize this. These guys, this is not Star Wars or Star Trek. You didn't punch in, I want to go to the moon and the computer, and, and it just took them there. I mean, this was uh, this is something that had to be continually monitored, maintained, in order for it to work. And we're told that it did, but when you start understanding how this happened um, yeah you, you you've got to again common sense is gonna have to go wow this thing was obviously an amazing feat of, uh, of humanity yeah but the chances of something going wrong are so high and that the lack of redundancy like I said or the ability to correct things as needed as they would come up just wasn't there no no it wasn't and that is the sad and kind of funny part about all of this is, is that when you actually look at it and you don't need to be a computer expert to actually see this for yourself. I mean, you look at any aircraft today and when aircraft are flying, they have technology in the aircraft, but they also have it on the ground. Yeah. You have to have it on the ground to work. Uh, they, they work in tandem. Yeah. And with the Apollo missions, you didn't have that. And they did come up with a way, they said that, and I talk about this in the book, the Doppler effect. And that is, is that they had to find a way they could, I mean, radar didn't go out that far, so they had to find a way to keep track of the Apollo missions. And they said that they were able to do that with Doppler effect, but the Doppler effect requires additional equipment on your aircraft or spacecraft in order for that detection system to work fully. Well, NASA claims that they found another way to do that. And I write about that extensively in the book too for the reader if they want to check that out. My, when I was reading and researching, I was just thinking that NASA was making all this up on the fly as they went. You know, just, they would just write a script. That's exactly what this whole thing sounded to like to me, the Apollo guidance computer. It sounded like a script. And there's a computer expert, an article I read, I believe his name is- Xavier Pascal, Pascal or Pascal. Yeah. yeah. And he's done some really, really amazing work on this computer. And I talk about him in the book and I quote him a few times. He made a very interesting determination. He just basically said, he just flatly said it was, it was a fake. Yeah. And, and he, he would know. And you can purchase the other computers of that era as well, which is in the book, and the reader can read about that, read up on that. Great stuff. And, yeah, and he actually believes that insiders had planted aspects of that computer to let the public know eventually that this this was fake. So, because um, he's he, he rightly says NASA are not that stupid. I mean, they're not stupid people. These are smart people. I mean, I, I mean these are smart people. I mean, I'm not questioning NASA's intelligence. But what I find very interesting is, is that the insiders were actually trying to reach out and they were basically saying, and the scientists said the same thing, they're not stupid people, they purposely built a fake computer. Period. Paragraph. Yes. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah. Well, we're crank time is just flying by here, and I, I feel like we've only got like halfway through it. So maybe I'll combine a couple of things. Sure. Um, the calculated neutral point you brought up, and that's the you know where you know they say that um, you know be the, the, between the Earth's gravity and the Moon's gravity, obviously that's going to affect the flight path and the speed and, and everything, the navigation, that sort of thing. The calculated neutral point. I'll maybe kind of combine that with the Van Allen belts, but both of these together. I would say as you did your research and you're starting to learn about these things and where they are and, and you know how many belts, where the, the neutral point was, all these different things, as you investigated all of these sources, you found that there was a lot of inconsistencies on where the neutral point was, how many belts there are, at what height they are, and all of these things. So maybe you can kind of summarize that, but just the inconsistencies in, in, in the research that you went through, you had all these official sources saying different things. Which, yeah, if that, if, if, which shouldn't be the case. Yeah, and I'll start with the Van Allen belts first. I mean, that was that was, uh, that was very startling. There was a discrepancy in terms of the distance of the Van Allen belts, and it, it came from several sources. And these several sources were either connected to NASA or indirectly connected to NASA. And I'm thinking that well, you should be precise on this information. I mean, how can you have several scientists in the know? disagreeing on the uh, distance in terms of the Van Allen belts. And then there's two belts, officially there's two belts. There's the inner proton dominated belt and there's the outer dominated electron belt. And according to the official narrative, NASA, the Paul spacecraft would have gone through the outer region of the outer belt. Their claim is, is that that was the less intense in terms of radiation and the astronauts could have survived it with the additional cheating, which I'll talk, which is talked about in the book at great length. Yeah. But what I found very disturbing too is not just the different distances of the Van Allen belts, but and the different altitudes that we were getting, but also the actual radiation intensity. Yeah. Now uh, there's research in Australia, Jarrett White, who does some very good work on the radiation. He's got a couple of really good videos. I stayed away from that. It's a very complex subject, and what I found about that is is that from all the research that I've done, even the experts can't agree. I mean, you cannot have, you cannot find two experts on Earth that agree that agree about terrestrial background radiation. But lo yeah. and behold, everybody agrees about radiation in space, something we know nothing of. That's a good way to boil it down, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so what I found very interesting too, though, was the mixed messages that NASA was giving in terms of the radiation belts through its own scientists versus the National Research Council, which was giving different information. And you would think that they would be in sync here, especially since the National Research Council has done work for NASA as well in terms of, you know, studies and, and whatnot. So I, I found that, and that is I talked about extensively. Now, in terms of the different belts, I just want to touch on that before I move on to the eco-gravosphere. And that is, in 1958, there was a program called Project Argus. And Project Argus was that uh, they exploded three atomic bombs in the Van Allen belts, an altitude between 250 up to, I think, 400 miles. And that irradiated that area, uh, alarmingly so. And that also created an artificial radiation belt. So that's three radiation belts now. Then in 1962, they came up with a program called Operation Starfish Prime. That's right. This was one bomb, one explosion, 250 miles up, but this was a thermonuclear weapon. This was a thousand times more powerful than the bombs that they detonated back previously with um, Project Argus. So Starfish Prime was a real problem. So you have this huge megaton explosion in the atmosphere, above the atmosphere, 250 miles, and that added another artificial radiation belt. Now, here's where it gets funny. NASA says, oh yeah, by the time the Gemini programs, which coincides with the Starfish Prime Blast, NASA says that the explosions from the Argus project dissipated. So the belt dissipated, the artificial belt dissipated by 1962. But of course, then we have Starfish Prime, which added another belt. So first we went from three belts back to two, now we're back from two to three. And it gets better. And I was gonna it, say, I remember in the book you brought up there's actually four. And this is on NASA's website they have found a third radiation belt around the Earth. They don't have it formed. They could only speculate. And what they speculated was that it was probably formed by a solar flare. Yeah. Okay. So, but again, it's a speculation. 
So NASA said, and I quote, this requires rewriting of the textbooks. Now, go back to the last mission, Apollo 17. Apollo 17 was lost in December of 1972. Four months before that, on August 4th, I believe, there was a solo flare, a massive solo oh, flare. Yes, say, one for the history books, yeah. One of yes. the most massive ones we've ever observed. Exactly. But this one was the most powerful one in the 20th century. It caught NASA off guard. Yeah. So if you're saying, NASA, that the solar flare caused the third radiation belt to form in 2012, then by deduction, it's obvious that there was another belt formed in August of 1972, four months before Apollo 17. So now you not only have the two actually formed radiation belts, you've got the other radiation belt formed by Starfish Prime, the megaton explosion, and now you've got a fourth radiation belt formed by a solar flare of August 4th, 1972. Now, so that's four radiation belts that Apollo 17 would have had to travel through, okay? Now, I need to ask, I, I say this to people, has it ever occurred to you why NASA would take a chance on sending another manned mission four months after the most serious solar event ever recorded, which would have killed the astronauts in an instant if they had got caught in it? Mm-hmm. Nobody's able to be, nobody's able to answer that. You know what their answer is? Their answer is, well, obviously there wasn't because they went there and back and safe. That's their answer. Yeah. How do you argue with that? Because <laughs> again, that's faith. I mean, that's just, it's belief. It's just yeah. belief. It's just yeah, belief. kind of logic. Yeah, exactly. It has to be. So yeah. And I don't want to dig in too much because I want people to go read the book because yeah. you, you know, you dive into these, these topics uh, at very deep levels and uh, you know, all of the different sources and, and everything and where this came from is, is um, it, it's really solid. So where that kind of came to mind, I was going through your book, and you, the way you kind of put the case together and, and break it down is 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 good. We're coming up on an hour. There's a couple of things. See, we hopefully sure. we can get through them quickly. You kind of talked a little bit about the sturdiness and the and the shielding of the command module and the lunar module, and you you kind of get into that, and 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 that's that's stuff that is talked about as well. But you know, what, the stuff you brought in up about the lunar module was just the lack of sturdiness of this thing to it. To be able to survive in the most, you know, hostile environment known to man is really quite remarkable. And you brought up some interesting points. I don't know if you want to kind of expand a little bit on, on that, but the command module and the lunar module when it came to shielding and the sturdiness of these things yeah. was remarkable. Remarkably how, you know, how little these things really could have stood up. Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, I, I talk about, but what I found the most interesting is that, well, to, to quickly just uh, mention the command module, there definitely wasn't enough shielding for the actual radiation intensity up there. And the simple reason is, is that NASA doesn't know the intensity of the radiation. They don't have the equipment to detect that. And that came out again with Jared White. He actually stumbled on that by accident with some scientists and physicists at Los Alamos laboratory who were doing some experiments. And they admitted, we just don't have the equipment to detect the real intensity of the radiation up there. So how can you design a spaceship to protect the astronauts when you don't know the level of intensity. And the other thing that I want to mention about the Van Allen belts is that it's in constant flux. You have the magnetic field. These particles are moving around yeah. all the time. Yeah. You can only make that determination with real-time information, and NASA didn't have that capability back then. I don't know if they have it now, but they certainly didn't have it back certainly then. Certainly didn't then, yeah. Exactly. The lunar module is very interesting. The lunar module, according to, I believe it was astronaut Alan Bean, who said that it was so fragile, it wouldn't be able to withstand its own weight if it was actually placed on Earth. It would collapse. And what I find interesting too, Scott Henderson has actually done some work on Tor values, and that's in terms of vacuum of space. And I'm going to be discussing that. I'm going to be discussing Scott Henderson's work in my next book. Take just the lunar module, visualize it for a second, and picture the astronauts in there, fully pressurized, and the actual spacecraft bulged. Yeah. Okay. The walls, they had, to, in terms of weight, so they had to conserve weight as much as possible. And they shaved the walls of the lunar module down so fine that you had aluminum equivalent to three sheets of kitchen foil. That was your protection from life and death. Your protection was three sheets of kitchen, well, I think it's like something like one to the five thousandth of an inch or something like that. I mean, it's just incredible. Three sheets of kitchen foil. I use that all the time. 
right? <laughs> and you can just put your finger through it. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty funny. You know, I'd imagine is. like you drop, you know, I think there was something I read one time and you probably know it where somebody said, you know, you drop a screwdriver or something, yeah, you know, that, and it, that, it just penetrated the, whole, all the, the skin. Yeah. Yeah. Just, and one of the astronauts, when one of the astronauts actually was doing, uh, was working there and he was at the time of that actually happened. And he says, he says, my goodness, he says, I got to go up in this tissue paper. So he actually said that. You know, so they were given all kinds of hints that, and that's why the book is called Hiding a Hopes in Plain Sight, because I believe that the astronauts themselves were giving hints about the fact that it's, you know, hiding a hopes in plain sight. I mean, what is the best way to hide anything? Put it right in front of you. Most people don't see it. I didn't, I didn't, for, for years I didn't see it myself. We're, we're all, I mean, we're all subject to it, right? And it, it's difficult, right? I mean, we're human beings, we're only taking so much. And we have our daily lives to think about as well. So we're all busy. It's not that the people it's not that people are stupid, it's just that they're so busy with other things. That's right. right? That's right. That's and right. so it's right it's the best place sometimes it's right in front of you and you just can't see it. Well, exactly. And and that's the point. I think uh, people like you and, and so many other researchers out there that have taken the time, they invested the time, money, <laughs> you know, resources to go in there and and you know, peel back the layers of the onion, and, and really, and start comparing information. Okay, this is what NASA said here. Does this jibe with this and that? And look to make that reconciliation. That's what the research is all about, and that's where you find, you know, these anomalies. That's where you find these inconsistencies. And then you say, okay, there's something here, and then you dig deeper and you understand this more. And that's the process you've obviously gone through here at a very great level. And the book is wonderful, and it's just part one. But you, kind of what I what I got out of reading the book was just to kind of summarize and i think you mentioned this in the book probably where i where it resonated with me was that you go through like the testing that led up to these things you know to be able to do this they had to test they had a test 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 it should be exhaustive test before you send man you know to these to these uh, altitudes you know to this environment the testing had to be exhaustive and what you found what i took away from the book was that the tests got to be the when the criteria got too stringent nasa simply kind of lowered the requirements down and said oh well it's not as it's not that tough it's it's actually down here you know the radiation was actually here and we were able to withstand that you know and it was just it seemed to be point after point after point they seemed to lower the requirements down so that their testing whatever they did manage to get showed that it would suffice you know so that their equipment and processes and everything worked flawlessly. That's that's kind of what the bottom line was for me. Yeah, um, and that actually I found that the most disturbing of uh, of all. And I noticed that with the uh, if I like they, they back, changed the rules. In other words, they had kind of like changed the rules the during the game. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. They moved the goalpost, and I found that for me that was an admission. That was an admission that. We don't know the dangers out there. Our technology can't handle what we think is out there, so we're going to lower the requirements so we can show that lower the requirements so our technology can pass the test. That's basically what it was. We yeah. saw that with the uh, Saturn V missions. There was no testing of the F1 engines except for two flights. There was no testing of the F1 engines in the actual flight conditions. Yeah, the limited testing. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, the limited testing. This should have been exhaustive. This should have been years and years. This should have been so documented. All the failures and what they did to improve them, and it's just the stuff doesn't exist. Well, the proponents actually had one proponent say to me, "This was really funny." He actually said to me, "He said, well, the reason why there was minimal testing, engineers at NASA are really smart with the computer programs that they have today, computer simulations, in which a lot of aircraft are now designed right on computers, and they run simulations." In simulations, which simulations, you simulations. Years ago, yeah, yeah, they still do hundreds of hours of flight testing. Yes, and there's just one quote, a brief quote that I like to read for you wrap up here, regarding what you're talking about in terms of moving the goalpost. The original failure criterion for the SBS propellant tanks were perforation of the service module honeycomb skin panels. Because of the failure criterion was too stringent to meet the desired probability of mission success engineers considered an alternative. If the original criterion had remained, the test shown in figure four would have been an SPS tank failure. Translation, it failed, lower the requirements. That's from NASA's own report. And, and now it works, in theory. Yeah, right? in theory, in theory, exactly. And now, and now it works in theory, that's all you gotta do. If the theory yeah. seems to work, then we're fine, right? Exactly, exactly. Wow. 
So anyway, I encourage everybody listening, you know, get a hold of the book. We'll include some links in the show notes so you can pick it up. It's a wonderful book. And I would be remiss if we did not give you a chance to maybe tease a little bit, because this is this is part one. It even says there on the book, part one. So you are working on part two right now. Can you give us just a little sure. little taste maybe of what we can expect in, in part two? Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, send a thank you to Scott Henderson. I'm going to be working with him on a chapter of my next book. And I'd also like to thank Marcus Allen. Marcus Allen has been very supportive of my work as well. And I'd like to thank the editor. Uh, Marcus Allen, by the way, is for those that don't know, he's the UK distributor for Nexus Magazine. And I'd like to thank the editor in Australia, the head office for Nexus Magazine, Duke and Rose, who reviewed my book and they wrote an article and a review of my book in the last Nexus issue. So I just wanted to mention them and thank them for that. It's really helped. In terms of part two, yes, I'm actually starting writing. I've just started the introduction and chapters one and two, and I'm hoping to have it out early next year. And it's going to basically leave off where part one, start rather, where part one left off. And the general theme of part one was analyzing a particular mission, that of Apollo 11. So we got up to, as they're about to orbit the moon, and part two will begin there. There's going to be a few other things in part two. There's going to be another little curious history to NASA before I get into the actual Apollo lunar landing. But it will, the general theme will be, it will start with the lunar module. We're doing a lot of analysis on that, the preparations for that, what they did, how they trained, and how they supposedly landed on the moon. And there's going to be a few other interesting things. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Russians and why, you know, I hear this so many times. Well, if the Russians knew it was a hoax, why didn't they say anything? So I'm going to be talking about that as well. So a lot of few, a few good things. Had a lot of fun and learned a lot by reading the book. So uh, congratulations again on the, on the book. And uh, we are really looking forward to part two. And uh, let's let's get back in touch uh, once that gets out and uh, get a chance to read it. I'd love to love to uh, love to do this again. For sure, for sure, sure. I'd love to do it too. All right, yeah, thanks, Randy. Appreciate it. Have All a great right. week. All right, you too. Cheers. Bye bye.